You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by the founder of the Mars Society, Dr. Robert Zubrin. Dr. Zubrin is an aerospace engineer and inventor, and he's the author of The Case for Mars, Merchants of Despair, and science fiction novel First Landing. Dr. Zubrin has also recently authored The Case for Space, How the Revolution in Spaceflight Opens Up a Future of Limitless Possibility, which is available from Amazon. Dr. Robert Zubrin, welcome back to the program. Thanks for inviting me. Now, Dr. Zubrin, you have a new book out, The Case for Nukes, and I admittedly am a proponent of nuclear energy and using are creating resources, as you put it in the book, creating resources from the dirt, essentially, and creating a bright human future using science. Now, what brings you to this book? In other words, are you saying that we really need to reassess our views on nuclear energy and use that to move forward? Well, certainly. And nuclear power is one of these things that is a powerful empirical demonstration of the idea that it is people that create resources. Okay. Well, in the 1890s, people knew a fair amount about science, but they had a real problem, which was that the geologists knew enough about geology to know that the features of the earth had to be at least hundreds of millions of years old. And the physicists were saying, no, we know how much mass the sun has. And even if it was made out of pure coal, it couldn't burn for more than 2 million years. So it's impossible that the earth could be hundreds of millions of years old. Now, in fact, the earth is actually billions of years old. But even so, it couldn't be hundreds of millions because they didn't understand that there was another force of nature that they were not acquainted with, which was nuclear forces. And uh, in fact, the sun, of course, is powered by fusion power. And and it is billions of years old, not millions of years old. And it has billions of more years to go. And similarly, on Earth, you look at the oil. Well, first of all, 200 years ago, even oil wasn't really a resource. But no one used oil for anything. You had to develop oil drilling and refining and machines that could run on it to turn it into a resource. But the average piece of granite has enough uranium and thorium in it that If you turn that into nuclear power, a kilogram of granite has as much energy as 100 kilograms of oil. So we're surrounded by mountains of energy once you have the understanding of how to get it out of the rock, okay? So people create resources, and nuclear power uh, represents an enormous resource. And and there may be others beyond nuclear power, because I don't think we know all of physics yet by any stretch. But certainly, uh, nuclear opens up uh, a vast future. Now, first, fission, splitting the atom, and the idea that we can, and we have, obviously, we've been using nuclear energy in that form for for decades, but this seems like the easiest way to solve Earth's problems right now. In other words, we, we have, I mean, people frame it all kinds of different ways, energy crisis and climate change and all that, but the fact is, is that it is a clean energy proposal, so long as we can store and deal with the waste, the remnants. So how do we do that? You know, how do we rethink this idea instead of thinking about things like Yucca Mountain and, you know, getting into huge fights about it? How can we make an efficient nuclear energy system for 2024? Well, first of all, the only reason why nuclear waste is an issue, but coal waste isn't, is because nuclear waste is addressable. Okay, the the amount of waste we get from burning coal, for example, is billions of times more, or, or well, tens of millions of times more than you get from nuclear power. And it's not even conceivable to address it. Okay, so no one even tries. The amount of nuclear waste we produce is quite small, and all the nuclear waste uh, that we've produced since the the Manhattan Project in 1940s, you could store um, under a single uh, football field if you wanted to. And there is no technical problem to this. The the Navy stores its nuclear waste. You know, the the largest number of nuclear reactors in the United States are actually in submarines and surface ships, not even on land. And the Navy has them, and they store their waste in salt caverns in New Mexico. 
The commercial industry has been stopped from storing its nuclear waste by anti-nuclear activists who see this as a tactic for wrecking the nuclear industry by making it impossible for them to store their waste. And I mean, it's really remarkable, these people claiming they're concerned about safety when they're forcing the nuclear waste to be stored in the suburbs of American cities instead of under a mountain in New Mexico. Now, there, there's more efficient things you can do, the Yucca Mountain plan, but it, it would work. First of all, you could reprocess the waste and actually uh, remove the plutonium that's in it, the uranium that's in it, and use them again. And whatever waste you dispose of would be much easier to dispose of simply by turning it into glassified form and putting it in stainless steel cans and dropping it down into the middle of the ocean. That would save you the problem of building Yucca Mountain. But once again, such plans, either for reprocessing or for subseabed disposal, have been blocked by anti-nuclear activists for the purpose of creating a, a problem for the nuclear industry. It's like, you know, if, if somebody was against cars and they managed to take over City Hall and they pass a law saying it is illegal to park a car in this city and anywhere, and on the sidewalk, on a parking lot, in a garage, anywhere. And then they say, well, cars are impossible because there's no way to park them. It's a totally artificial problem. Now, France, for example, has been much more aggressive in in using and deploying nuclear energy for you know very long time, the whole time, and they have mastered reprocessing. In other words, they can take spent fuel rods and extract the plutonium and uranium, and make a much much more efficient system than we were ever used to during during the hit. Correct, and also France. And I discuss this in my book, The Case for Nukes. France is the only sizable advanced country that has actually decarbonized its electric grid. And they did it by making themselves 75% nuclear and about 12% hydroelectric. Okay. So in Germany, where you know the Germans always go around talking about how green they are and how close they identify with nature and so forth and so on, they produce five times as much carbon emissions per unit electricity produced as France does without all the claptrap. Without all the claptrap. And so yes. what exactly got in the way? In other words, if we were to reinstitute a building of nuclear power plants in the U.S., it would be titanically expensive. What makes it so? Is it the regulation at the behest of the uh, anti-nuclear crowd? Yes. The nuclear power was growing very rapidly in the United States by the late 60s or into the early 70s. In fact, we were building, well, starting two nuclear power plants every month, every month. And, and it was uh, moving so quickly. In fact, the oil industry got scared that nuclear power would replace them. And they funded, well, the Sierra Club got a million dollars from Exxon and uh, Arco got uh, Atlantic Richfield, another major oil company got into the game. And you know, the professional environmentalists had been uh, actually for nuclear power in the 60s because it has less pollution than coal or oil, but they got bribed and they became anti-nuclear and, and, and very aggressively so. Now, there was another aspect to it as well, because also very active in the early 70s, we Malthusians were organizing. They put out a report called the Limits to Growth, in which they said, we have to stop global economic growth because otherwise we're going to run out of everything by the year 2000, all the oil, all the copper, all the zinc, everything's going to run out. And we got to stop uh, economic growth. And in their statement that they issued in 1974, justifying their reversal of their stand on nuclear power, the Sierra Club at that time didn't talk about waste or any of these hazards. They said, we have to stop nuclear energy because it could lead to unnecessary economic growth. Okay. And that is the real reason, that is, the Malthusians, which, frankly, look, the idea that there aren't enough resources to go around, from that it follows that human uh, numbers, liberties should all be uh, curtailed and someone has to be empowered to do the curtailing. Okay, that's the basic thesis. Okay, Malthusianism is a justification for tyranny. There isn't enough resources, so we need a tyrant. And so this was pr being promoted uh, very aggressively by the Club of Rome and others in the early 70s. And they managed to recruit the environmentalists to be instruments of this policy. Stop economic growth by stopping nuclear power. And now the interesting thing that actually happened 
was as another adjunct to this, okay, in 1973-74, the Arabs, the OPEC, uh, instituted their oil embargo and it multiplied the price of oil fourfold, okay. Now that led to massive profits for the oil companies and also, of course, for the OPEC nations, uh, but it also priced oil out of the electric power market. So despite the anti-nuclear movement, nuclear power has replaced oil as electricity source. That is, in, in 1973, 20% of American electricity came from oil and only 3% from nuclear power. Today, those numbers are exactly reversed. 20% comes from nuclear power, 3% comes from oil. And th that's because basically the oil interest got too greedy and ran the price up. But nevertheless, they continued their campaign, which was then taken up by a coal interest who were much more seriously involved, uh, like 60% of electricity came from coal. They launched a campaign to against nuclear power. And in fact, this gentleman, Amory Lovins, who's a major anti-nuclear activist, if you look at his article in Foreign Affairs in 1976, he, he, he talks about ultimately we will reach the renewable energy future, but coal is the bridge fuel. <laughs> Coal is the bridge fuel to the clean energy future. <laughs> and the only thing dirtier than coal is biomass. And the 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 point was, frankly, the anti-growthers oppose nuclear power because it would solve a problem they need to have. And I in the 70s, uh, I debated these people and, you know, they'd say, oh, we have to get away from fossil fuels. They're causing so much pollution and we're going to run out of them if we keep using them. I said, well, here's nuclear power, no pollution and you'll never run out. He says, well, we hate that. And in fact, they hate it more than they hate fossil fuels, precisely because it solves all the problems that they associate with fossil fuels. Scarebucks. Now, there was a particularly egregious scare book, the population bomb, that actually went so far as to predict that we would run out of aluminum by the year, I think 1990, something like that, which proved to be a titanically wrong prediction. And that in fact, most aluminum that we've ever mined is still around. And that, that which does not end up in landfills gets recycled and we end up with more and more aluminum every year. <laughs> so the question is, is that what effect did these scare books have in this? And, and how did they relate to the uh, anti-nuclear movement? Well, once again, what you have is all, all these things. And I have another book, I don't know if you've read it, called Merchants of Despair came out around 2012 or 13. It's worth reading, but it, it, it goes through the entire line of Malthusian uh, outfits from Malthus himself, which was used to justify massive oppression by the British in Ireland and India. The, that is, you know, there just isn't enough food, so they should be taxed because otherwise they'll multiply out of control. And then the eugenics movement, Nazism, the population control movement, the environmental movement, and then, of course, the um, climate crisis movement, all of which basically say variations of the same theme, which is there isn't enough to go around. Therefore, humans, numbers, activities and liberties must be severely constrained and therefore someone must be empowered to do the constraining. That's what it always adds up to. And, you know, in, in the 70s, it was we have to stop economic growth because otherwise we're going to run out of coal. Now it's we have to stop economic growth because we're not going to run out of coal. Okay, that is e either way it's a problem whether there is enough coal or there isn't enough coal. The, the 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 problem is always different. The solution is always the same. The question of thorium. We have lots and lots of thorium that could power the world. Yeah. You know for a very very long time. So what do we do with the, uh, the thorium option? You know, because you can't, you know, there's always, uranium always has the problem that you can enrich it and make weapons and things like that, but thorium, no. So what can we do to take advantage of a thorium nuclear model for the whole planet? Well, the, the main thing is to lift the prohibitive regulatory regime. In other words, if you go to any utility right now and say, I have this new kind of reactor, it's gonna be better, whether it's a thorium reactor or a breeder reactor, okay, or you name it, okay, and you say, look, thorium is much more plentiful than uranium, and breeder reactors can get 90% of the energy out of the uranium instead of the 1% that pressurized water reactors get. And you'd think that'd be a great sale. 
you get 90% of the energy instead of 1%. Utility will tell you the following. Number one, we don't care because the cost of the nuclear fuel is only 5% the cost of the power. What? What's the other 95%? The construction cost, which has been vastly inflated due to regulatory overreach. That is, you know, the first nuclear reactor we built, shipping port, took three years to build. Now it takes 16. And as the data in my book, The Case for Nukes, makes clear, the cost of a nuclear power plant goes up as its construction time squared. Squared. Okay? Because the project gets increasingly bloated as well as extended over time. Okay, so that 95% is 25 times bigger than it should be. So if you if you cut that down by a factor of 25, the 95 would be 4%. So actually fuel costs would be more than the construction costs, but instead they're one twentieth of it because the construction costs have been so inflated. And furthermore, what the utility will say you is not only do I not care about the fuel cost, if I went with a new kind of reactor, the regulators are sure to give me a much harder time than they're even giving me now when all I'm doing is asking them to license the exact same kind of reactor they've licensed a hundred of before, right? In other words, you, you have a problem getting a pressurized water reactor license. They've been around since 1954. The, 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 imagine coming in with a breeder reactor, and that's the last thing they want to do. So the hyper-regulation has not only inflated the cost of the existing kinds of nuclear reactors, it has completely stopped progress. There's the reason why we're still using pressurized water reactors. I mean, they're a perfectly functional kind of reactor. Don't get me wrong. I'm not with the people who say we shouldn't use pressurized water reactors because they're old-fashioned. No, they work fine. But we could do better, yes. But the possibility of doing better is even more forcefully stopped than by the regulation, than even uh, the obstacle it poses to maintaining the status quo. Do you think that there could be a kind of black swan event within nuclear energy? And what I'm referencing specifically was years ago, Lockheed floated the idea of compact fusion, fusion reactor the size of a bus, yeah. and then it all went dark. And <laughs> good luck talking to Lockheed about that, that subject right now. And my question for you is, could we end up with fusion out of nowhere and leapfrog uh, fission? Well, I don't know if we would leapfrog fission. I think we will get fusion much quicker than most people think at this point uh, because there has been launched, and I discuss this in the book, The Case for Nukes, an entire entrepreneurial revolution in fusion research that is inspired largely by SpaceX, even though Elon Musk has no involvement with fusion himself. It's the example that he set with SpaceX that is relevant here where he all of a sudden showed that it was possible for a well-led entrepreneurial team to do things that previously thought that only the governments of superpowers could do, and not only that, do it much quicker and better. The investors took a look at Fusion and said, maybe it's the same problem, okay? Maybe the problem isn't really technical. Maybe it's institutional. This is the wrong kind of organization is pursuing it. And so you've got a whole raft. I mean, there's like at least six or seven entrepreneurial fusion companies that have gotten over $500 million in investment each, and then a whole bunch more that have gotten over $100 million. And these people are moving on timescales of years, not decades. And so I, I think that this decade, we will see a fusion ignition, magnetic fusion ignition, and it won't be done by ITER, which probably won't even be turned on in this decade. ITER is the big international bureaucratic fusion program. Uh, it'll be done by one of these startups, whether it's Commonwealth in Boston or Helion in Seattle or even Takamak Energy in uh, Britain. It'll be one of them or uh, Tri Alpha Energy in California. Nuclear energy on Mars. Now, as we move towards exploring Mars and heading there, what benefit will nuclear fission and fusion have in creating a Mars colony? Well, nuclear energy is absolutely essential for the human settlement of space. It's actually essential for the effective exploration of space, but certainly settlement. I mean, look, Mars, no fossil fuels on Mars. Um, solar energy is only 40% as strong as it is on Earth. Wind power is negligible. Hydroelectric we will not have till after the planet is terraformed. So we're going to need nuclear power. So the Martians are going to be big pushers of nuclear power. And I think they will push for more advanced reactors, uh, certainly at a minimum breeder reactors, because you're not going to want, if, if you do have to import fuel from Earth, then uh, mass becomes very important. And if you have to mine it on Mars, 
you don't have this global transportation system to get your uranium ore from the other side of the planet, they're going to have to make use of low quality ore, which means they will want to get 90% of the energy out of the uranium for sure, instead of 1%. And then their fusion, the Martian water is, uh, the deuterium is five times as plentiful in Martian water as it is in Earth water. And so fusion is the ideal power source for Mars. So I think that the Martians are really going to be uh, key uh, innovators in I aggressively advancing uh, both fission and fusion. How did Mars get so much deuterium? It's because the lighter hydrogen left the planet. Ah, so it's a concentrating effect. Interesting. I was not aware of that. Yeah. So what does the rest of the profile of Mars look like? I mean, do we have an idea geologically on its abundances of things like uranium? In other words, we're going to need to make the, the fuel there. And do we have any idea where you would go? You know, what region you would go on Mars? Well, we, we haven't yet found the high quality ores. We have found that in terms of the low, the ordinary, you know, the everyday rocks, uranium and thorium are about as common as they are on Earth. So there's no reason to believe that there aren't concentrated ores on Mars as well. But, you know, we hadn't found concentrated uranium ore on Earth until, well, the 1940s when we started looking for it. It wasn't something that was well known. We did know something about thorium because thorium was actually used as the mantle in kerosene lanterns. So thorium was actually a commercial product before the nuclear age. But uh, uranium, no. And it wasn't until we said, okay, well, let's see if we can find some of this stuff. And then we found it. So I don't think there's much question that uranium and thorium are available on Mars. But, you know, the, what we've landed... Um, five or six landers on Mars, let's see, two Curiosity rovers, Spirit Opportunity, and the Sojourner rover. So that's five rovers that have actually landed on Mars, plus a couple of static landers. That's really not much of an exploration program. One could play with ideas, though, about ores on Mars, and that's two-thirds the size of Earth, and maybe the ores, and it's got huge volcanoes, you know, volcanoes that dwarf ours that might have brought materials up that might actually make Mars a better ore planet than Earth is. <laughs> I mean, can you envision that? Uh, yes, and there are people that do maintain that. And um, and furthermore, I mean, and this is not just uranium, but even things like gold. You know, the Earth has been picked over for gold for, you know, 3,000 years since it became money. But nobody's done that on Mars, so... So that means that we have plenty of options for a colony, yeah. you know, on Mars. And in fact, speaking of ores, I mean, we photographed iron meteorites sitting unrusted on the surface of Mars, you know, with the rovers. I mean, we have a lot of resources that we could create there that, that would facilitate a colony. So do you see, finally, after all these years, from the case for Mars to now, do you see that we're going to do it, that we're finally, after all of the fits and starts, going to go to Mars and put a permanent human presence there? Well, uh, it, I, I do. Now, there's two ways this can happen. That is, either SpaceX succeeds or it fails. If SpaceX succeeds, I, I think we're going to see humans on Mars within 10 years of today. Okay? And in other words, it must talks about two, three years. No, that's not going to happen. But 10, yes, absolutely. Now, that's not a sure thing. SpaceX could fail either because of a technical accident. You know, what if someone crossed some wires in that booster yesterday and flipped around and crashed into a Brownsville or something? You know, the things that would really set them back. Or if Musk gets himself into trouble with crazy remarks about the Securities and Exchange Commission or something of that sort, that could stop SpaceX. But on the other hand, SpaceX could succeed. So far, they've done pretty well. And if they keep going like this, we're on the Mars in 10 years. Now, if SpaceX should fail, if Musk should skate off the edge of the ice, which could also happen because, as noted, he's a risk taker, it'll still happen, but it'll take another 10 years beyond that because that's about how far – he's being copied. Right now, there's five companies in China that are working on knockoffs of the Falcon 9, okay? And in addition, there's the Blue and uh, Rocket Lab and some others – uh, he, he has shown that these Falcon-type rockets, largely reusable, not completely, are very profitable and very feasible. That's all happening, but they're about 10 years behind Musk right now, all of them. 
But if you have five or six copycats coming on board, then certainly one of them will succeed in taking the thing to the next level beyond what you did. And so if he drops the flag, others are going to pick it up. Now, but that is getting human explorers to Mars. The settlement of Mars brings in additional questions. Okay, And this is why the Mars Society, which I lead, is starting this thing called the Mars Technology Institute. It is to develop the technologies needed to settle Mars. Okay, Because let me give you one example. Food. Food is not an issue for a human Mars exploration mission. You can just bring the food. Okay, you don't need to grow your food on a round trip human mission to Mars. Okay, uh, if you bring all the food you need, it'll be about the fourth largest uh, thing in your mission mass manifest. Okay, so yeah, it's not in the noise, but it, it's not the driver of the mission, a cost or mass or anything of the sort. But if you want to colonize Mars, you can't bring your food. You're going to have to make it on Mars. And while you could support a small Mars base, with a greenhouse doing more or less conventional agriculture under greenhouse conditions, that by a base, I mean an installation with 20, 50, maybe 100 people. If we're talking about not having 50 people on Mars, but say 50,000 people on Mars, that doesn't work. We need fundamentally new ways of creating food. And in fact, uh, one of your associates before the show was asking me, what was I doing in Florida, talking to the very famous uh, biochemist Stephen Benner last week? And the answer is I was talking with him about exactly this problem of creating fully synthetic food. And because you see food, if you take an Iowa cornfield, which is the most efficient form of food production you have on earth at any real significant scale. It is 0.2% efficient at turning sunlight into corn energy. That is the, you take the corn that is grown in the field, you take the sunlight that hits the field, it's 0.2%. And if you feed the corn to a cow to get meat, it's 0.02% efficient. You compare that to chemical engineering processes, which are typically on the order of 50% efficient. How can we do 50% or even 10% efficient food production Okay, and I believe that biotech holds the answer here, and we're working on a solution. And when we have it, we're going to spin off a company to create it. And this will be of tremendous benefit to people on Earth as well. We're going to make food a lot cheaper because we're going to make its production vastly more efficient than you have here. And then as we discussed nuclear power, more advanced forms of nuclear power that would meet the needs of Mars, which would not only get 90% of the energy out of the uranium thorium, but also be much simpler in their internal construction than current reactors are. Because on Earth, you know, if you need a bundle of zirconium tubes or something to put inside your reactor, you can pick up the phone. On Mars, no. So we're going to need a much simpler type of, of internal construction. And then I think there's things that can be done with artificial intelligence that would be very powerful because you're going to have a severe labor shortage on Mars. I'm going to need to multiply the power of labor. So those are some of the areas that I think need to be developed to make the not the first human mission to Mars possible, but the colonization possible. And the idea of the Mars Technology Institute is that we're going to spin off companies around each of these technologies and these will make money which will be used to fund further research and ultimately if we can create an entire ecosystem of such companies it will be a financial engine that is sufficient to send humans to mars to stay the malthusians were wrong about one fundamental thing and the fact is that human innovation it creates an efficiency of things like agriculture we seem to have a lot more room for that. Wouldn't you agree with, with those percentages and that being able to innovate human agriculture through developing agriculture on Mars, we have a lot of room left to grow in, in as far as uh, food production goes, right? Right. But it, it's not so much that we're going to create a lot more land on Mars, although in principle one could. No, it's exactly the opposite. It's that the Martians are going to learn how to grow vastly more crops in much smaller amounts of land. That's the problem that they face, okay, that is land on earth is not free, but compared to what is needed to turn Martian land into farmland, it's extremely cheap. So we're talking about being able to produce as much food inside of uh, a structure the size of a small house comparable to what someone can grow on uh, a thousand acre farm. Now, creating a colony on Mars, say we do it, 
successfully. 200 years from now, we have a permanent presence on Mars, maybe perhaps millions of people living there. Where do we go after that? In other words, where is the next body in the solar system other than the moon that we could go to create a colony, you know, a best suited body in the solar system other than Mars? Well, you know, I, I have another book coming out, by the way, next February called The New World on Mars, What Can We Create on the Red Planet? And it discusses a lot of these questions, including the different kinds of Martian city-states that might develop, but also it discusses the development of the asteroid belt. And the asteroid belt is going to be developed from Mars. Okay, It is vastly easier to get to the asteroid belt and from the asteroid belt back to Mars than it is from Earth. Okay, so Mars is going to be to the asteroid belt what San Francisco was to the California Gold Rush, okay, or Seattle was to the Yukon. It's the jumping off point. So yes, the asteroids will be developed from Mars, and I think the Martians will play the dominant role in that, actually. But the other thing about developing new branches of human civilization, and you'll notice I said plural, because I think there'll be many different city-states founded on Mars by people with different ideals. Now, some of those ideals will be so unworkable as to make those cities fail, but there'll probably be more than one model that will succeed. And so you'll have a variety of new kinds of social systems and city-states uh, emerging on Mars. And But one thing they'll all have in common, that they'll be extremely creative, they'll all be centers of invention, uh, because they'll need to be. Well, to meet the needs, their own needs, but also, by creating inventions, that's how they'll get money for imports from Earth, by licensing inventions on Earth. So we're going to have some highly inventive additions to the human family of societies. And, and if you think about it, what is America's greatest contribution to the world has been? Yeah, some people, like you and I, our ancestors came here and they found a better life. But frankly, they were only a tiny minority of the people in Europe, the over 99% of people who were in Europe stayed in Europe. So how has America benefited them? Well, by inventing the steamboat and telegraphs and light bulbs and centrally generated electrical power and recorded sound and motion pictures and airplanes and nuclear power and home computers and laptops and iPhones, okay, among other things. In other words, you create a, an additional center of invention. And that's what benefits humanity. Now, as we as we spread out into the uh, into the cosmos, does it make more sense that we would create humans, you know, genetically engineered humans, to be better suited for living on Mars than an Earth-based human is? I mean, is that where we're going to go? Is to sort of genetically tailor the Martians? Well, now that's an interesting question, and it comes back to what I said about there being numerous societies with numerous sets of ideals that go to Mars. Now, some of them might embrace exactly what you just said. They said, we can use genetic engineering to make people better, both better adapted to Mars and perhaps even more intelligent in general, for example. Now, that there's uh, an argument for that as a course of action. There's also an argument against it, of that practicing uh, eugenics not in the way the old eugenicists did, which was finding people to eliminate, but still through upgrades and self-breeding that this might do things to the society that are unhealthy. So which of those societies is likely to succeed better? The one that embraces human self-modification or the one that rejects it as impinging upon the dignity of man? Well, I don't know the answer to that question. That question will be resolved by what actually happens. We'll see which is the better option for uh, progress and survival. Now, looking in further out into the cosmos, and say we colonize Mars, and we create world peace and prosperity and make ourselves presentable to aliens, but we're still going to need to look for aliens and see if there's anybody else out there in the great depths of space. Now. You have some interesting ideas on SETI, a little bit of a different take than normal. And one of those is looking for artificial stars via parallax. Can you give us an overview of that method of SETI? Well, sure. Okay, so in the first place, I don't think that the current 
SETI Institute and similar organizations that their approach of, of trying to listen for radio signals from other stars is likely to be productive. First of all, if you just look at it, the data rate that you could achieve even with very powerful radios broadcasting from other stars to Earth would be extremely slow. I'm talking about micro bits per year, kind of slow. That is the data rate just by, by, so they'd have to have enormously powerful transmitters. And furthermore, they'd have to be transmitting for millions of years. Because while life on Earth could have been detected by extraterrestrial astronomers for the past 400 million years by detecting the oxygen in our atmosphere, and that, by the way, is how I think we're going to detect life on other planets outside of our solar system within the next decade or so, with the Webb telescope and even Hubble given that we now know about so many extrasolar planets, soon we'll develop the technique to take spectrums of their atmospheres. And if you have oxygen in, in quantity in those atmospheres, that's strongly suggestive of life because oxygen is so reactive with so many other things, including hydrogen, carbon, silicon, aluminum, iron, that, that, that are extremely common. Free oxygen needs a, a, a living source to create it, to p push back against all those chemical reactions that can occur. But so, you know, they could have detected easily life on Earth in the age of the dinosaurs, but they listening for the radio signals, they would have gotten no, nothing. So they really have to be very patient. On the other hand, while radio signals, uh, first of all, are not really a very good way to communicate between stars, unless you already know the people there and you have conventions set up and you know each other's languages and, and, and so forth and modulation techniques, looking for artifacts of things that involve lots of energy, which include, for instance, interstellar spaceships, if you could know or even guess uh, the kind of propulsion system they would use. That's a much higher power emission source than a radio. And even more would be artificial stars. It's possible in theory to create a star by creating an artificial black hole. And I have a paper on this. It's on Centauri Dreams uh, that people can find to look up Robert Zubrin, Artificial Singularities, you'll see the paper. Uh, the thing about these uh, uh, artificial stars is that while they would have a spectrum that are similar to type K red dwarfs, which are the kind of stars one rank smaller than the G star, which is our star, the, the, they would be much smaller than an actual K star. So while you would see something that looks like a K star at great distance, because it would be uh, small, in other words, on an astronomical plate, it'd be one of those very dim little dots that, you know, you have like millions of them in the background of every astronomical plate, which are presumably stars at a great distance. So this one will look like them, except that it would have to be much closer. In other words, it would... A K star that's a thousand light years away, an artificial K star would be about the same brightness if it was 50 light years away. And if something is 50 light years away, you could know that because it would have parallax. That is, as the Earth moves around the sun, things that are relatively close by in interstellar space actually appear to move because you're seeing them from a different angle. Things that are really far away don't move because the Position change of the Earth on either side of the Sun is insignificant compared to the distance to something a thousand light years away. But compared to something 50 light years away, it's enough to make that thing move on the plate. And so one way we could detect extraterrestrial civilizations would be to look for artificial stars. In other words, look for the things they build that are really big. Could something like, say we terraform Mars, just an idea and we create it and you know warm it up and we're you know just hypothetically able to do that say we do it and mars becomes a habitable world but it also becomes an impossible world because again two-thirds the size of earth and all of a sudden it has an oxygen atmosphere thick everything does that create a techno signature meaning that you can detect terraformers from a distance and maybe that's when you get the communication because then you know there is a civilization there that's spacefaring. Well, a couple of things. It's interesting. I would think that the thing that would give away a planet as being terraformed 
is if it had greenhouse gases in its atmosphere that do not occur naturally. So for example, when we talk about terraforming Mars, we talk about putting CF4, carbon tetrafluoride, in its atmosphere because that's an extremely strong greenhouse gas. And given Mars's distance from the sun, in order to make it warm enough, you'd want to greenhouse it on purpose and with gases that are more potent than carbon dioxide in that line. So CF4 would do it, but CF4 does not occur in nature. It's an artificial gas. So if the aliens wanted to know that Mars was terraformed and if they had appropriate instrumentation, if they detected an atmosphere with CF4 in it, they would say, my God, somebody's terraforming this place. In other words, Freon worlds. Yeah. And you, you know, with these very, very efficient greenhouse gases that just don't occur in nature. And that's it. There, there is a, a dead ringer of right. sorts. Right. And so if we had the right kind of telescopes, that'd be a way that we could look for them. There's always going to be people, though, that say, oh, I'm skeptical of that. <laughs> so you detect the terraformers and you're always going to have some scientists somewhere saying, well, no, that's that maybe a volcano could create that freon and things like that. How do you get past that? In other words, at what point do you push it over the hill that we have found a techno signature? And I wonder about this. Well, that's uh, there's no hard and firm answer to that. I mean, the, the answer a scientist will generally give you is when it becomes clear to everyone that this is the simplest explanation. But in fact, a lot of these are socially determined. Let me give you an example. You know, the Viking results where you had the gases emitted from the soil corresponding to the detection of life, but no organic molecules detected in the soil. And so they said, well, that means that these gas emissions had to be chemical, not biological, because we detected no organics in the soil. Now, it, it's been shown, however, that if there had been organics in the soil, they would have been destroyed in the GCMS, the gas chromatic mass spectrometer, because by heating those organics in the presence of the perchlorates and peroxides that are present in Mars soil, you would, well, turn them into carbon chlorides and, 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 and lose them. In other words, they would have been destroyed by the detection system itself. So the interpretation, now I'm not saying that proves that they were there, but I'm saying is that the nature of the instrumentation is such as it would have destroyed them if they were there. And in fact, before Viking, people thought that the GCMS was stupid because it would necessarily detect large amounts of hydrocarbons because the delivery being delivered to Mars by meteors. And so when it detected none, people said, oh my God, there isn't as much as we assumed would naturally be there. Well, the reason why there weren't as much as they assumed would naturally be there is because the detection process would have destroyed any hydrocarbons, whether they were there from meteors or from life. And so has it, for various reasons of which scientists were more prestigious and so forth, uh, the respectable position within the NASA-funded community has been Viking showed there was no life in the Martian soil, when that's not the data at all. The data is gas was released from the gas release experiments, and we do not have a proper uh, instrumentation assessment of the uh, how much hydrocarbons there are in the Martian soil. So, but things, scientists want to be respectable if they're going to get the government funding. And so very few have been maverick enough to challenge that consensus. So anyway, to get back to your thing is, it could be a while before there's a consensus, but what you will have is that people will have the data and it will be debated among people at large, not just in the science community, but at, uh, throughout society, doesn't this look like life the, or, or even civilization? Uh, uh, fluorocarbons in the, mar in the atmosphere of Tauceti 4. And, you know, people will draw their own conclusions. Not every uh, conclusion, well, in any, certainly not in philosophy and religion, but even in science is universally held. In regards to the labeled release experiment at Mars and the positive detection of what very well could have been microbial life on that planet, shouldn't we send an updated labeled release experiment that 
closes some of those holes in the original experiment that call it into question. Before we actually go there, shouldn't we learn if there's microbial life there and be prepared for that? I mean, obviously, it probably couldn't do much to us if it's alien, but... <laughs> well, no. Okay. I agree with the first half of your question, but not the second. I think we should send additional life detection experiments to Mars. And right now, the NASA Robotic Mars Exploration Program has been narrowed down to sample return. They're going to spend $10 billion over the next 15 years on this one mission, leaving no money for other missions. At the recent Mars Society Conference, a woman who was a representative of this Mars Life Explorer mission, she posed a very interesting mission designed to detect life in the Martian soil. And it was just a medium mission that is a, a mission that would be about as expensive of like spirit or opportunity, not a flagship mission, just kind of a medium-sized mission. Say, so, okay, when are you going to do this? It looks, looks great. She says, well, uh, we're hoping to get a, a accepted for the 2039 launch opportunity. Why 2039? I mean, that's 16 years from now. 16 years ago, no one had even heard of Barack Obama. I mean, who knows what the world's going to look like in 2039? And just, well, there's no money. It's all for the sampler turn. Sample returns $10 billion. I would rather fly 20 $500 million missions in that time, which would include a variety of life detection experiments, including potentially another labeled release, but there's a variety of other experiments that people have proposed, as well as helicopters and rovers and drillers and orbiters and all sorts of things with all sorts of instruments and all sorts of mobility systems and just have a much richer and varied program. I think that would be the right thing to do to address this and many other questions. Now, do I think we need to do this before we send humans to Mars? No. I think that the chance of getting diseases from Mars is much less than you will have when you walk out your front door today, because we know that the Earth is filled with pathogens, both those that are active now, and if you dig in your garden, you'll return sediments from 100 years ago and 500 years ago, and you know, and when the Black Death was around and all that. The, 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 and we don't stop people from digging because of fear of medieval microbes or Mesozoic microbes, for that matter. And Mars, on the other hand, has no uh, macro fauna on its surface. There's no practical life cycle for Martian pathogens because they don't have hosts. There may were, very well be life on Mars. I actually think there is, not actually in the surface. My, I think it'll be in the groundwater, about a kilometer underground because uh, that's where you have liquid water, which is really what life uh, first. But the idea that these organisms will be dangerous to humans or that we should stall human expeditions to Mars because of fear of microbes, that's like saying we shouldn't allow people to dig for dinosaurs because of fear of microbes. In fact, it's a lot less sensible than saying we shouldn't allow them to dig <laughs> for dinosaurs <laughs> or fossil, collect fossils, <laughs> you know, or Indian arrowheads, you know, those Indians had diseases. Who knows what's on those arrowheads? Yeah. And well, the other thing is that if you have alien life, the compatibility question is, I mean, it is very unlikely to be able to do anything yeah. to you, especially if it's like a opposite chorality or something like that, where it just, it can't even eat you. <laughs> you know? yeah. Now, once we get to Mars and part, this is key to the SpaceX equation is that once you get there, you can launch off the surface of Mars. Do you see a day? after the colonization of Mars and the realization of, of humans and, and a permanent presence on Mars, do you see that as the future of space exploration, meaning that most rocket launches going to Europa and all of this stuff will actually occur on Mars as opposed to Earth? Sure. Uh, it, for the outer solar system, you're, you're much better positioned leaving from Mars, uh, not just because of the lower gravity, but also because of its position relative to the sun. And you know, if it's further out of the sun's gravitational well as well. And also, and we can readily make rocket propellant on Mars. Uh, the, the primary rocket propellant of interest is methane oxygen, which can be readily made from carbon dioxide and water, both of which are abundant on Mars. And that, of course, that is the reason why Starship uses methane oxygen, so it can make its return propellant on Mars. And a Starship positioned in low Mars orbit and refueled in low Mars orbit would be able to deliver 200 tons of cargo to Ceres in the main asteroid belt. Starship refueled in Earth orbit couldn't even reach Ceres with no cargo. I would dearly love it if <laughs> life in the universe, SETI, was accomplished on Mars by people born on Mars, and we discover life at Europa, and it was actually the Martians telling 
old earth <laughs> that, that that there is uh, life out there and that's how we discover it but that's how the future goes right yep that's how it goes no uh, well first of all I, I think we may discover life on mars well before we have settled mars because i think once we have astronauts there with drilling equipment and can reach the groundwater i i think they will find life and i tell you why i think that because it, now, there's a question of what kind of life they'll find, but at a minimum, they'll find some kind of life because there was a natural transfer of material between Earth and Mars three billion years ago when Mars had oceans and Earth definitely had life. So Mars would have had life uh, at that time, even if the only source was the Earth. Now, of course, it could have gone the other way because Mars had oceans before Earth had oceans. And so Mars probably had life before Earth had life. But if Earth life came from Mars... What we might expect to find on Mars is not just microbes comparable to Earth's bacteria, but simpler, in addition to those, things that are simpler. That is, one of the principal mysteries about life on Earth is why the simplest free-living forms are bacteria, which are extremely complicated things. Okay, And this is the reason that has supported now for over a hundred years, a theory known as panspermia, which argues that life on Earth is an immigrant phenomena. For the same reason that there are no genuine medieval castles in the United States, okay, there's some fake ones, but not the real thing, no Roman ruins, no Bronze Age structures. It's because, uh, you know, it's the earliest genuine structures of Western civilization that you have in the Americas date from the late Renaissance. Okay, and because we're immigrants, the Bronze Age didn't happen here. Okay, the medieval period didn't happen here. We started after that. And similarly, life on Earth appears to have started after its early stages. Okay, on the other hand, if life on Earth and Mars simply originated in separate ways, each in their own way, then we'd probably find things about Martian life that are completely different than Earth life. For instance, it might not use DNA and RNA. Okay. Or it might use eight-letter DNA instead of four-letter DNA, or something like that. And finally, we might find life that is completely identical. And that would, to me, actually mean that we are both seeded from the outside, from a common source. But these are interesting things that we're going to find out as soon as we have explorers on Mars. Yeah, and you can ask questions about things like like the the sun's birth cluster. In other words, when life arose here, there were stars that were related to the sun that may have the same sort of planets that that were much closer than, you know, obviously they're dispersed now, but back then, not so much. And that you could have had panspermia between star systems in that situation. Sure. Now, my question for you here is Venus. Venus is sort of an overlooked planet, but it hosts a very Earth-like environment way up in its atmosphere, and there are hints of life there as well. Can you make a case for Venus as well as Mars? Well, I could make a case for exploring Venus. I think it, scientifically it'd be interesting to check that out, what you just said, to check out those traces for life in Venus's atmosphere to see if they're real. I don't see Venus as a very good prospect for colonization, though. I think, though, it is an object of scientific interest and we should explore it. Now, my last question for you is related to what we were talking about with, with DNA, XNA, as they call it, you know, and, and other forms of biology that are not quite like us. Now, you have also floated the idea of, of sending out our DNA as an artificial panspermia. Can you give us an overview of that? Well, sure. And I also then turned that around and said, well, this makes a lot of sense. Our aliens are already doing it. Okay. Because the other thing, so I have another paper that people can find on a Century Dreams, and perhaps you can link to these on your website, uh, which is uh, interstellar communication using microbes. Okay. Because microbes obviously carry a great deal of information in their DNA. Okay. Now, one thing you could do, and people actually have done, is they've taken books and they've used DNA coding to basically print out the content of the book, okay? You know, using DNA, you could make all the different letters of the alphabet, which means you could write words and, and, and books, okay? But I think more interesting here is not that form of communication in DNA, not looking for aliens who have put, you know, their dictionary in DNA and plans for starships like were sent to um, Jodie Foster by the aliens in the movie Contact. But putting their DNA in the DNA. <laughs> that is, if you think about 
the type of communication you, well, maybe not you and I, but societies do when they're talking to people they don't know. The most common form is propaganda. That is, be like us. Okay, we want you to be like us. So that's Radio for Europe. That's Radio Moscow. That's the Gideons putting their Bibles in the hotel room, right? They want people to become Christians, so they leave Bibles in the hotel rooms, okay? This is a form of propaganda, and propaganda is very close to a related word, which is propagation, okay? And it's an adaptive form of behavior because if you can get other beings to be like you, you're multiplying yourself, right? You know, this is why Christianity and Islam are uh, very big religions, whereas Judaism is a much smaller religion in terms of numbers, because th those other two have been much more active in seeking converts. So they got big. So those forms of life that propagate themselves are going to outnumber those that don't. So aliens, I'm not saying they. it's a question of wisdom, but the aliens that are likely to be found are those that have propagated themselves. Okay, you see what I'm saying? So, therefore, maybe they're doing that. Maybe they are, if Earth and Mars even were, uh, life got started there through panspermia, maybe the panspermia was not natural but artificial. And how would we distinguish between natural panspermia and artificial? Well, I discussed that in my paper. It's not the easiest thing, but well, basically you're looking for signs of intelligent design, as it were. Not intelligent design by God, but intelligent designs by engineers. You know, I give you an example, though, of, of, of what you could do. If you were to genetically sequence the American Mustang, okay, you would find that at one time in the past, it was a much more robust kind of horse that could carry medieval knights. That's because the American Mustangs are not true wild animals. They are animals that have been rewilded who are descended from horses that escaped from the Spanish conquistadors. Okay, So the Spanish conquistadors were riding military horses that had been engineered to carry armored knights. They'd been bred for that. So Somewhere in that genome, you could probably actually make the Mustangs give birth to, what were those kinds of horses called that the Knights rode? I forget. But you understand what I'm saying. The, 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 just like a group of scientists a few years ago actually managed to get some chickens to, uh, ch chicks to hatch out of eggs, and the chicks had teeth. Why? Because the chickens, like all birds, are descended from dinosaurs, and the dinosaurs had teeth. And the unused genes are still there in the file cabinet, okay? Just like you may still have a license to practice some profession that you no longer practice, okay? 1970s, I drove cab in New York City. I just, uh, the other day I was unpacking some old stuff and I found my cab license, okay? And while I wouldn't want to become a taxi driver again, if I, I couldn't live either as a businessman or an engineer or as a school teacher, which is also a previous profession of mine, I could revert and still make a living as a cab driver, right? And I even have the license. So, and it's like uh, human embryos at a certain point, their development sport gills because we're descended from fish, right? So maybe there's things in the genome that would reveal prior history that didn't occur on earth. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating, hen's teeth hidden in the genetics, you know, just sitting there recessive. Dr. Zubrin, thank you. I appreciate you appearing with us again, and I hope to do it again when your new book comes out. There'll be links to all of your materials at Centauri Dreams and links to your books. Right. The Case for Mars, The Case for Nukes, The Merchants of Despair, all of it and, will be in there. And, and, and the other book, new, The New World, What Can We Create on Mars? It's already available for advanced purchase on Amazon. Fantastic. I look forward to talking with you about it once I get a chance to read it. <laughs>